Hello, DC Circuit students. Welcome to the fourth and final portion of our RC Circuit transient analysis. Just to recap, our first two uh, recordings included derivation of expressions for uh, the voltage drop over a capacitor in an RC series circuit for the first portion of a square wave, where we were basically inducing just a step voltage. In our second video, we derived an expression for the full square wave response if we were going between a high and low of an amplitude in a square wave signal. And we also correlated that with Tony Covell's universal time constant expression. And in our third video, we looked at the TINA simulation of that same kind of circuit and did a pseudo measurement of what would be a perfect RC circuit. In this final video, we're going to be taking this to a real circuit. We're going to uh, assemble or we're going to look at what has been assembled for the circuit. And then we're going to uh, measure a response to a square wave signal that we imposed with our arbitrary waveform generator with our Picascope USB oscilloscope. So we are starting with in our video capture here just a picture of our circuit and we'll only have that displayed for the first part of the video because it takes up um, quite a bit of space in our video file so we'll take this off we have a um an, a, a series rc circuit so we have a resistor this is a fairly large one so this is 11.79 k so this is that's the the real uh, value of the nominal 12 k resistor and then we have uh, a, a 470 nanofarad capacitor, so the 0.47 um, microfarad, and that's nominal. And this particular capacitor has a plus or minus 5% tolerance, so um, again, this is a nominal value. So we're again using our, our sort of our power rails to impose our square wave signal. So this lead here is coming from the AWG, I can show this on the camera, output of my picoscope function generator and oscilloscope, and then I'll be using the scope leads from channels one and two to measure uh, both the imposed or delivered signal and then the signal uh, voltage drop over the capacitor, the capacitor voltage signal. So as we all know, we don't use our scope leads to deliver a voltage signal. We use them for measurements. So I'm using just a, a grabber to BNC here for my, what's my function generator a, or AWG signal. Now for channel A, my yellow scope leads, I'm going to go ahead and measure the signal that I'm imposing. So you can see that clipped here. And I don't really need the, the alligator clip necessarily because as we all know our scope, scope probes are grounded so they are at a common uh, with the grounding of our, um, of our function generator or our signal generator. But I'm doing it anyway just to basically connect the shielding of my, of my scope cable. So most importantly I'm going to use another measurement wire to measure the voltage between the capacitor and ground. So I am I am placing my, my voltage measurement V sub C lead right here on row 10, which is where the resistor and capacitor are at isopotential and I will measure between that and ground. So up from ground. So in so doing, I am not uh, unintentionally shorting some portion of my circuit. And I will just leave the, that lead um, there. So at this point, we don't need to show the circuit anymore. Everything we're going to do that's important now is going to be seen on our um, on our picoscope screen. So we can I'm going to take a pause and I'm going to reconfigure the camera so we can have a little bit um, less bulky recording. OK, at this point, we're, we're seeing a, a static symbol signal coming from our camera, which unfortunately we can't turn off mid recording. Um, but on our main screen, we should be visualizing our Picoscope screen capture, which we're displaying on our main screen. So right now we are seeing a live view of our oscilloscope. 
And we're not seeing any signal because we are neither imposing nor collecting. As you can see, our, our channels A and B are both turned off. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and open our function generator. And even though we won't see it, we're going to go ahead and select a signal with a, uh, with a frequency and an amplitude that we think is, is reasonably appropriate to capture the time constant of the circuit we built. Now, if you remember from the previous video where we, where we simulated this in TINA, we found that a 20, um, a 20 hertz signal uh, ended up being reasonably good to capture a full period um, of this particular waveform, given the time constant we would expect to have from these components. So we're going to go ahead and, and start with that. And we're going to go ahead and turn it on. And of course, we don't see anything because we're not measuring anything yet. So we're going to start by turning on our, our capture of the full, the full circuit, which might give us something that's a little odd. We're going to go plus or minus one. And it tells us that we really want plus or minus two. And we'll add a trigger so that we can actually see something. So this is the full response of the circuit, including the resistor and the capacitor. And you can see it kind of has more or less the shape we would expect for the voltage drop over the capacitor. So um, the capacitor may be kind of controlling the shape a bit. But what we really want is that V sub C signal. So for that, we are already measuring it, um, but we're not displaying the measurement. So we're going to go ahead and turn that signal on. We're going to use the same. Uh, we're going to use the same plot. Make sure that we measuring on the same scale, and we're going to do some scale adjustments here. Okay, at this point, I have um, I've adjusted the scale, so I am displaying about one and a half uh, cycles or waveforms, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off the channel that's measuring uh, the full circuit response because that's really not going to help us get at our, uh, our time constant. So now I'm only looking at channel B, which is measuring the voltage drop over my 470 nanofarad capacitor only. And as you can see, it's got a little bit of noise on it. So one of the tricks that we can do with our picoscope oscilloscope is we can do a little bit of signal averaging just to clean that up. Now, if we do too much, we can actually alter um, the, the value. So we don't want to do a whole lot, but we might want to get rid of just a little bit of this, this chatter to make it easier to make measurements. So we're going to go to nine bits instead of eight for our averaging. And you can see how that cleaned that up a little. It's going to make it easier to, to measure. So one of the first things we're noticing is that <clears throat> we may or may not have truly come all the way to steady state. It, it looks like we're flatlined here. Um, but there's, there's kind of an indication we may not be. So let's go ahead and, and in, decrease the frequency of the waveform just a little bit. Well, okay, we just cut it in half, so let's try some middle ground. We, we sure know we've hit steady state there. We had calculated it previously, true steady state being 17, but let's try, let's try 15. Okay, we're, we're pretty sure we've reached steady state, and that's indicated by this flat line here. Okay, so now we're seeing a waveform very, very close to what we saw with our, um, with our simulator. And so the next thing we need to do is get some marking, kind of a reticule or graticule, we, we would say if we we're in a microscope. So what we're going to be looking for, again, is the difference between the voltage of our maximum point and some point that corresponds to that maximum times um, negative one plus two times exponent or e to the negative one, which will be the point, the, the, the voltage that we have when t equals tau. So let's see, what is our maximum voltage? And we're, sh we're showing that here with our dotted line. Well, we can actually have the picoscope figure that out for us. So we can select the channel. We can look at add measurement. We're looking on channel B, and we would like to say, what's maximum on, on each waveform? And it comes up at the bottom here. So 
This is what we're seeing here is a little bit of sag. So we had said, please give me a waveform with an amplitude of one volt. Well, of course, we're only measuring the voltage drop over one part of the circuit, so we don't necessarily expect it to be one volt. Um, but so we could just be seeing that or we could be seeing some sag, um, maybe a combination. So we're seeing a value of 9.68.5 millivolts. So that would be our starting voltage. That, that would be the voltage that the capacitor has when it's all charged up and then ready to discharge uh, as we go through this negative going portion of the cycle. Okay, so we're gonna put one of our time markers right at the at sort of the, the cliff edge there of that part of the circuit. Then we're gonna grab another marker and we're gonna grab our calculator and we're gonna calculate the V sub C value that we would expect given our, our V max of, of 0.9685 volts. Let's grab our calculator here. I'm gonna go from the inside of the expression to the outside here. So I'm gonna go one negative, Raise e to that, 0.3678, and that's negative. Excuse me, I'm going for the absolute value. One minus, enter, raise e to that power, two times, one minus, plus. So I have negative 0.2642, now I'm gonna multiply that by 0.9. 685 times. So I'm going to be looking for a V sub C value of negative 0.256, give or take. So I'm going to adjust this um, measurement bar that I'm wiggling back and forth until I'm seeing a value of, of negative 2.56, as close as I can get. And so I'm going to be, there's going to be a little freehanding error here. Negative 2. Point, oh, almost. And I could expand the scale. Negative 2.57, that's, that's probably about as good as I'm going to get. Now I just move my time mark over so that it intersects with a portion of the V sub C curve where I've, I've drawn this horizontal line. And now I'm going to look at the delta, which is this third column in my, my little measurement box that I'm circling around here. So I look at the white, which is indicating the, the white marks down here, which is my kind of my time mark slider. So mark number one is at negative 31.6 milliseconds. Mark two is at negative 37.32. So these two. And the delta says, what's the delta between? Well, that delta between is actually the T, which is corresponding to tau. So this measurement says that I should be, that I have measured a tau for this circuit equal to 5.703 milliseconds. Okay, so now I'm gonna check that against the as calculated value. I know that, that my calculated value for the time constant would end up being 470 times 10 to the minus nine, nominal value for my capacitor, and I could multiply that by 11.79 times 10 to the third value for my resistor, and I get and multiply by a thousand for milla, and I get 5.5413. Okay, that's pretty close. Uh, not exactly, we do have some error. So the next thing I can say is, well, am I within the plus or minus 5% error for my capacitor? I'm actually measuring a little on the high side. So what I can ask myself is, um, if I add 5% 5 uh, 5 to the value of the capacitor, what would I get? So I can do 570 times 10 to the minus nine, enter 0 0.05 times plus, so I'm now working with what could be a higher value capacitor. And of course I measured the value for my resistor, so I have basically already accounted for the tolerance times 10 to the third times. Oh, excuse me, I needed to go, okay, yes. So that as calculated value would be 5.8 two milliseconds. So what that says is my as measured value is within the tolerance of my, my 
use my real resistor that I used in the circuit. Now that doesn't mean there aren't other sources of error, but it means that my, my measurement can be explained by what would be predicted just from the, the error and the of, of you know, accuracy, tolerance of the components, excuse me, tolerance of the components. Um, that is, um, that's probably the biggest source of error in this case. The next biggest probably being the display and the on-screen measurement. But the fact that we are within, um, you know, fairly close value to the as calculated and, and within the, within the, um, the error of the components means that we've made, um, a good measurement. There's no reason to think that we're necessarily off in our calculations or that we are, uh, measuring at the wrong point in our circuit. So to recap, uh, what we've done is we've built a real circuit on our proto board, analogous to what we built in our TINA simulation software. We are measuring effectively the discharge curve of that capacitor uh, on this, what would be the second half of a square imposed square wave uh, signal that we've imposed. We've chosen a frequency that corresponds to what we think uh, would be appropriate for our time constant, so we can look at a full cycle and get a good visualization. We can reach steady state, uh, as, as shown by our flat line. We have the appropriate shape of curve that we predicted for the voltage drop over our capacitor. And we've used our calculations, including the maximum value for V sub C versus the calculated value of V sub C when T equals tau to choose the, the appropriate voltage on our curve. And then we found the T, the course, the time that corresponds to that and gotten an as measured value of tau shown up here. So that concludes our four part video series on RC time constants, calculation, simulation, build and measure. Hope you've enjoyed this and please be aware that all of these same rules apply to an RL series circuit, a resistance resistor and an inductor. However, the derivation is slightly different and the relationship between resistance and inductance in your time constant tau for an RL series circuit is different. So that can be a good exercise um, for you to go through in classwork, but you will have the same kind of time constant a voltage drop relationship where time, the bigger the time constant, the slower the response of the circuit, regardless of whether it's capacitive or inductive. Happy measurements.